Chapter Three of the Gold Sickle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gold Sickle by Eugene Sue, translated by Daniel de Leon. Armel and Julian. The numerous family of Joel gathered in a semicircle at one end of the spacious hall impatiently awaited the combat with ma'am margaret holding the place of honor the stranger stood at her right her husband at her left and two of the smallest children before her on their knees margaret raised her distaff and gave the signal for the combat to begin the lowering of the distaff was to be the signal for the combat to end julian and armel stripped down to the waist preserving their breeches only again they clasped hands each thereupon slung on his left arm a buckler of wood covered with sealskin, armed himself with a heavy saber of copper, and impetuously assailed each other, being all the more spurred by the presence of the stranger before whom they were eager to display their skill and valor. Joel's guest looked more highly delighted than anyone else at the spectacle before him, and his face lighted with warlike animation. Julian and Armel were at it their eyes sparkled not with hatred but with foolhardiness they exchanged no words of anger but a friendly cheer all the while dealing out terrible blows that would have been deadly had they not been skillfully parried at every thrust brilliantly made or dexterously avoided the men women and children in the audience clapped their hands and according as the combat ran cried her her julian her her armel such was the effect of these cries of the sight of the combat of the clash of arms that the huge mastiff deborah trud the man-eater felt the ardor of battle seize also himself and barked wildly looking up at his master who calmed and caressed him with his hand perspiration covered the young bodies of the handsome and robust julian and armel each other's peers in courage vigor and agility neither had yet wounded the other let's hurry brother julian said armel rushing on his companion with fresh impetus let us hurry to hear the pretty stories of the stranger the plough can go no faster than the ploughman brother armel answered julian and with these words julian seized his sabre with both hands stretched himself at full length and dealt so furious a stroke to his adversary that although the latter threw himself back and thereby softened the blow his buckler flew into splinters and the weapon struck armel in the temple the wounded man staggered for an instant and then fell flat upon his back amid the admiring cries of her her julian from the enraptured bystanders among whom stumpy was the loudest with the cry of her her after lowering her distaff as a sign that the combat was over ma'am margaret stepped toward the wounded combatant to give him her attention while joel said to his guest reaching him the cup friend guest you shall drink this old wine to the triumph of julian I drink to the triumph of Julian and also to the valiant defeat of Armel responded the stranger the courage of the vanquished youth equals that of the vanquisher I have seen many a combat, but never have I seen greater bravery and courage displayed Glory to the family of Joel glory to your tribe Formerly said Joel these festive combats took place among us almost every day now. They are rarer they have been replaced by wrestling matches but saber combats better recall the habits of the old gauls ma'am margaret shook her head after a second inspection of the wound while julian steadying himself against the wall sought to hold up his friend one of the young women hurried with a casket of lint and salves in which was also a little vial of mistletoe water armel's wound bled copiously it was staunched with difficulty the wounded youth's face was pale and his eyes closed brother armel said julian to him in a cheerful voice on his knees beside the prostrate armel do not break down for so little each has his day and his hour today you were wounded tomorrow will be my turn we fought bravely the stranger will not forget the young men of karnak and of the family of joel the bren of the tribe his face down his forehead bathed in cold perspiration armel seemed not to hear the voice of his friend ma'am margaret again shook her head ordered some burnt coal that was brought her on a little flat stone and threw on it some of the pulverized mistletoe bark 
a strong vapor rose from the little brazier and ma'am margaret made armel inhale it a little after he opened his eyes looked around as if he awoke from a dream and said feebly the angel of death calls me i shall now live no longer here but yonder my father and mother will be surprised and pleased to see me so soon i also shall be happy to meet them a second later he added regretfully how i would have liked to hear the pretty stories of the traveller what brother armel said julian visibly astonished and grieved are you to depart so soon from us we were enjoying life so well together we swore brotherhood and never to leave each other we did so swear julian armel answered feebly but it is otherwise decreed julian dropped his head upon his two hands and made no answer ma'am margaret skilful in the art of tending wounds an art that she learned from a druid priestess her relative placed her hand on armel's heart a few seconds later she said to those near her and who together with joel and his guest stood around to tatis calls armel away to take him to those who have preceded us he will soon depart if any of us has any message for the loved ones who have preceded us yonder and wishes armel to carry it let him make haste ma'am margaret thereupon kissed the forehead of the dying young man and said to him give to all the members of our family the kiss of remembrance and hope i shall give them ma'am margaret the kiss of remembrance and hope in your name answered armel in a fainting voice and added again in a pet and yet i would so much have liked to hear the pretty stories of the traveller these words seemed deeply to affect julian who still holding his friend's head looked down upon him with sadness little sylvest the son of gilhern a child of rosy cheeks and golden hair who held with one hand the hand of his mother henry advanced a little and addressing the dying relative said i loved little alanek very much he went away last year tell him that little sylvest always remembers him and embrace him for me armel i shall embrace little alanek for you little sylvest said armel added again and yet i would have liked to hear the pretty stories of the traveller another man of joel's family said to his expiring kinsman i was a friend of horan of the tribe of morlek our neighbour he was killed defenceless while asleep a short time ago tell him armel that daolus his murderer was discovered was tried and condemned by the druids of karnak and his sacrifice will soon take place who are and will be pleased to learn of duallus's punishment armel signified that he would convey the message to who stumpy who not through wickedness but intemperate language was the cause of armel's death also drew near with a message to the one about to depart and said you know that at the eighth face of the month's moon old mark who lives near glennon was taken ill the angel of death told him also to prepare for a speedy departure old mark was not ready he wished to assist at the wedding of his daughter's daughter not being ready to go old mark bethought him of someone who might be ready to go in his place and that would satisfy the angel of death he asked the druid his physician if he knew of some substitute the druid answered him that Geigel of Nuaren, a member of our tribe, would be available, that he might consent to depart in the place of old Mark, and that he might be induced to do so, both out of kindness to Mark, and to render himself agreeable to the gods, who were always pleased at the sight of such sacrifices. Geigel consented freely. Old Mark made him a present of ten pieces of silver, with a stamp of a horse's head, which Geigel distributed among his friends before departing. He then cheerfully emptied his last cup and bared his breast to the sacred knife amid the chants of the bards The angel of death accepted the substitute old mark attended the wedding of his daughter's daughter And today he is in good health. Do you mean to say that you are willing to depart in my stead stumpy asked the dying warrior? I fear it is now too late No, no, I am not ready to depart in your stead stumpy hastened to answer I only wish to request you to return to Gigel three pieces of silver that i owed him i could not repay him sooner i feared Gigel might come and demand the money by moonlight in the shape of some demon saying which stumpy rummaged in his lambskin bag took out three pieces with a stamp of a horse's head and placed them in the pocket of armel's breeches i shall hand your three pieces of silver to Gigel, said armel in a voice now hardly audible and for a last time he murmured at julian's ear and yet i would have liked to hear 
the pretty stories of the traveller. Be at ease, Brother Armel, Julian answered him. I shall attentively listen to the pretty stories, so that I may remember them well, and to-morrow I shall depart and tell them to you. I would weary here without you. We swore brotherhood to each other, and never to be separated. I shall follow you, and continue to live yonder in your company. Truly, you will come, said the dying youth, whom the promise seemed to render happy. Will you come to-morrow? To-morrow, by Hesus, I swear to you, Armel, I shall come. The eyes of the whole family turned to Julian at hearing the promise, and looked lovingly upon him. The wounded youth seemed the most pleased of all and with his last breath said so long then brother julian listen attentively to the stories and now farewell farewell to all of you of our tribe and armel sought to suit the motion of his hands to his words as loving relatives and friends crowd around one of their own when he is about to depart on a long journey during which he will meet people of whom they all preserve a cherished remembrance each one now pressed the hand of Armel and gave him some tender commission for those of their tribe whom he was about to meet again. After Armel was dead, Joel closed the youth's eyes and had him taken to the altar of grey stones, above which stood the copper bowl with the seven twigs of mistletoe. The body was then covered with oak branches taken from the altar, so that instead of the corpse, only a heap of verdure met the eye with Julian seated close to it. Finally the head of the family filled the large cup up to the brim, moistened his tips in it, and said to the stranger, May Armel's journey be a happy one. He has ever been good and just. May he traverse under the guidance of Tutates the marvelous regions and countries that lie beyond the grave which none of us has yet traveled over, and which all of us will yet see. May Armel meet again those whom we have loved, and let him assure them that we love them still. The cup went around. The women and young girls expressed their good wishes to Armel on his journey. The remains of the supper were removed, and all gathered at the hearth, impatient to hear the promised stories told by the stranger. End of chapter 3